people have seen the movie? <laughs> oh, yeah, this is my kind of crowd. Um, um, I would have asked if anybody hadn't seen the movie and then shown them the door. Fifty years ago, on this actual evening, um, Kleeg lights and uh, stars and glamour opening at the Rivoli Theater. Anybody remember the Rivoli Theater? Yeah. Um, uh, the opening of the 20th Century Fox filmed The, the Sound of Music. Um, it, it, it is, as I said to somebody earlier, as somebody who runs the Rogers and Hammerstein office, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Um, it is extraordinary. I know of no other movie that is anywhere near as popular as this and continues to um, just the, the love and, and affection that this film garners is, is amazing. 1983, Ronald Reagan is in the White House. Uh, the United States, for the only time in the Reagan presidency, is hosting a G7 economic summit. Uh, knowing that Reagan's strength was as a communicator and not so good on the facts, uh, <laughs> uh, James Baker, chief of staff, had presented, uh, prepared a big, thick briefing book for him. And uh, so Baker went in the next day and said, realized that the book hadn't been cracked, it hadn't been moved, nothing. And he said, Mr. President, you, ha you, you haven't read that. You haven't even touched it. And Ronald Reagan said, Jim, how could I have read that book? The Sound of Music was on television. <laughs> <laughs> so when Robert Wise came on board as director, uh, he was thinking about how he wanted to start the movie and how he was going to shoot it. And he had all these different ideas, and he kept discarding them in favor of, you know, the aerial shot that, that we all know. And he was worried because he thought, oh, I did that on West Side Story. And then he finally thought, well, I'm stealing, but I'm stealing from myself, so there's no problem. <laughs> and so I just want to tell you all the stuff that went into this uh, three-and-a-half-minute number that reads so seamlessly on the screen. But it started with, uh, okay, the decision to have the helicopter. Uh, when he decided uh, that the helicopter was going to shoot the opening, uh, think about it. You couldn't shoot it in the normal way because Maria is supposed to be alone in the meadow. And if you shot it the normal way, you would see the shadow of the helicopter on the meadow. Can't do that. So they say to the cameraman, okay, we're going to strap you to the outside of the helicopter. <laughs> and that's how we're going to shoot it. And understandably enough, the cameraman said, I don't think so. So <laughs> um, they had to get another cameraman. So yeah, just for that number. So they got uh, uh, this uh, British cinematographer who, who agreed that he would do it. So, uh, they, so they think they're set. Robert Wise is monitoring this halfway up a tree because Maria's alone in the, you know, we don't want to see the director anywhere. And uh, so the helicopter, uh, and they have the pre-record that Julie Andrews is going to lip sync to. And uh, so the helicopter zooms in, and there's no Julie Andrews. And that's because the sound of the helicopter was so loud that she couldn't hear Robert Wise call action. So she's just kind of waiting. And uh, so what they had to do was the choreographer, Mark Rowe, got a bullhorn. And when he judged that the helicopter was just, you know, the right speed for the approach, he literally took the, bull, the bullhorn and was yelling, go, Julie, go, go. And so Julie Andrews would come and stride into the meadow, but the downdraft from the helicopter was so extreme that it knocked her over into the mud. And so the biggest question I get by far, and Ted, I suspect you get this every single day of your professional life, which is why does everybody love this movie so much? I, I thought about this a lot, and it came back to me uh, watching this, because I could see how many people in this room had just grins on their face. It's, it's extraordinary. And I think, um, oh, this sounds, uh, what I'm about to say sounds so serious, as Woody Allen would say, I'm trying to achieve total heaviosity. <laughs> but, um, I, I think, uh, look, you know, all of us in this room, we have uh, so many advantages in life, starting with the fact that we live in the United States with our amazing freedoms that we have. And even with that, life can be unbelievably difficult. And uh, life can be scary at moments and dark. And 
I, I always think of it in terms of, you know, sometimes you just feel like the ground is shifting under your feet and, and you're not sure. And uh, what I think great artists do, and I think Rodgers and Hammerstein are great pop culture artists, absolutely. You know, these, these great artists, they give us these, these little corners of light and of understanding. And, and what they're really saying is, uh, you're not alone. And uh, it takes away the fear. And I think really at heart, what, what they're doing is, it's allowing you to form a connection with other people. And I, The Sound of Music makes me think about the E.M. Forster dictum, only connect. And I, I really believe it can do that. And, uh, you know, I started out by thanking everybody for being here because, you know, this is tonight's my night to connect. And uh, so if it's done in the form of a splashy musical with nuns and kids and scenery and, you know, I, I think it's pretty great. So. Yeah.